On our newscast tonight, just when inter-Korean relations seem to be on a positive swing, fresh news that North Korea's nuclear ambition may be as strong as they've ever been. A U.S. think tank says the Yongbyon nuclear complex capable of producing weapons-grade plutonium may be operational again. An argument between rival parties over the role of the NIS has paralyzed the National Assembly for weeks. In a bit to put an end to the bickering, President Park Geun-hye proposes a sit-down with the leaders of the ruling and opposition parties. With the world still at odds over what to do about the spiraling crisis in Syria, five members of the UN Security Council meet to talk about finding a diplomatic resolution. For these and more, stay with us. It is 5 a.m. in New York, noon in Damascus, and 6 on a Thursday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. To quell the continued disputes between parties, the lady steps in. Right, we begin with efforts by the presidential office to break the political impasse at the National Assembly. The nation's top office has proposed a meeting between the president and the leaders of the two main political parties. That proposal follows growing calls for such a meeting from the rival parties whose stark differences over the role of the nation's spy agency have paralyzed the National Assembly for weeks. Our Kim Yeon ji starts us off. A day after President Park Geun-hye returned home from trips to Russia and Vietnam, the presidential office announced that the president would like to meet with the leaders of the ruling and main opposition parties in order to address any concerns the parties may have. The meeting would take place at the National Assembly and would follow a briefing by the president on the success of a recent overseas trips. The announcement was made a few hours after Senate Party floor leader Choi kyung hwan and his main opposition Democratic Party counterpart Chun byung hwan sat down for breakfast Thursday to discuss how the rival parties can go about normalizing parliamentary business. It was the first time the floor leaders had met in two months. The National Assembly has remained virtually paralyzed for weeks over stark differences between the parties on the role of the country's spy agency, the National Intelligence Service. The Democratic Party has been demanding the agency be reformed from top to bottom and says the NIS meddled in last year's presidential election through a systematic online smear campaign against the opposition candidates. The Democratic Party has also been demanding that President Park apologize for the election scandal. When a special parliamentary probe into the scandal petered out with no tangible results in early August, the Democratic Party organized street protests accusing the ruling camp of blocking a meaningful investigation into the matter. The Senuri Party urged the Democratic Party to end its street protests and return to parliament. Because of the vast bipartisan differences between the parties, urgent issues like this year's budget and measures aimed at reversing a slowing domestic economy have been put on the back burner for weeks. The rival parties now hope to return parliamentary operations to normal before Chuseok the fall harvest holiday, which starts next Wednesday. Kim Yeonji, Arirang News. Now, the ruling party has welcomed the president's proposal for talks, calling on the main opposition to accept that offer. But the Democratic Party held back from giving a definite response, saying it will come up with an official position after looking further into the exact intention behind the proposal made by the presidential office and the issues to be discussed. Now, moving on, the government and the ruling Senate Party have agreed in principle to make Children's Day part of the so-called substitute holiday system. Now, this system gives workers an extra weekday off when a holiday falls on a weekend. It currently only applies to Lunar New Year's Day and Chuseok, the upcoming fall harvest holiday. But under the new plan, workers will also be able to take an additional day off when Children's Day, which is in May, falls on either a Saturday or a Sunday. 
On a different note, despite recent signs of improving inter-Korean relations, North Korea may be restarting a nuclear reactor that could produce weapons-grade plutonium. Now, that's according to a U.S. think tank pointing to satellite imagery taken end of last month that shows steam coming from a building at the Yongbyon nuclear complex in North Korea. The reactor is capable of producing plutonium, which North Korea could use to make nuclear weapons. Kim Min Ji has more. The two Koreas may be back on a path of improving relations, but denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula may still be a way off. North Korea appears to have restarted a reactor at its Yongbyon nuclear facility, with new satellite imagery showing white smoke billowing from a building near the reactor. The 5 megawatt reactor was shut down in 2007 under a disarmament agreement signed at the six party talks. It is capable of producing 6 kilograms of plutonium a year. The findings by the U.S. Korea Institute at John Hopkins School Advanced International Studies were released Wednesday. The institute said the white coloration and volume are consistent with steam being vented because the electrical generating system is about to come online, indicating that the reactor is in or nearing operation. In April, Pyongyang expressed its intent to restart the Yongbyon reactor, and the U.S. Institute believes a steady progress has taken place toward that goal since then. It is still unclear, however, whether the reactor is fully operational or in a trial run. The U.S. and other nations are reportedly analyzing the satellite images. Experts have said that the North may be using the reactor as a way to bring Washington back to the negotiating table. However, a spokesman from the U.S. State Department's East Asian and Pacific Affairs Bureau said Wednesday that North Korea's nuclear programs remain a matter of serious concern and reiterated Washington's stance that Pyongyang needs to abide by its commitments and abandon its nuclear activity. North Korea has repeatedly defied international calls to denuclearize and has conducted three nuclear tests since 2006. Kim min Arirang News. As the bloody conflict in Syria rages on, envoys from the five permanent members of the UN Security Council are meeting to discuss Russia's plans to put Syria's chemical weapons under international control. A week ago, the drums of war. Today, the softer hum of tentative diplomacy as the U.S. and Russia prepared to sit down for talks on the proposal in Geneva later today. Our Kim young reports. The death toll from the civil war in Syria is rising in the order of hundreds every day. But the United States says it's taking its plans for a military strike against Syria off the table. For now at least, and will hold discussions with Russia on its proposal to bring Syria's chemical weapons under international control. Given Congress general disapproval of military action, the U.S. has been forced to take the Russian initiative of finding a diplomatic way to resolve the crisis. We're going to work with the Russians, and it would, it would be irresponsible not to explore this potential diplomatic resolution of uh, this very serious matter. Envoys of the five permanent U.N. Security Council members met in New York to discuss plans to put Syrian chemical weapons under international control. France, the U.S. and Britain are eager to frame a draft resolution under which Syria would face military action if it fails to meet its obligations. But Russia, a staunch ally of the Assad regime, says that is unacceptable. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says he hopes the Security Council will play an effective role in resolving the crisis. I hope that the current discussions related to safeguarding Syria's chemical weapon stocks will lead to the Security Council playing an effective role in promoting an end to the Syrian tragedy. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry will meet with Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Switzerland Thursday for more discussions of the Russian proposal. The State Department has also confirmed that Kerry will meet U.N. Arab League Special Envoy on Syria, Lakhdar Brahimi, during his stay in Geneva. And as the likelihood of imminent U.S. military action fades away, activists in Syria say the Syrian government has resumed airstrikes against rebel-held positions. Kim young Arirang News. Digging deeper. 
getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Good head, class, if it's expert, Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. There were no surprises at the nation's central bank today. The Bank of Korea left its key rate unchanged just one week before the U.S. Federal Reserve is widely expected to announce a scaled back of its stimulus program. Arirang's economics correspondent Hwang Ji-hae has the details. Korea's central bank kept its wait and see stance for the fourth straight month in September, holding its key interest rate steady at 2.5%. Following its monthly monetary policy meeting on Thursday, the Bank of Korea said the local and global economies will stay on the path of moderate recovery in the coming months. The central bank has given a 3.7 percent growth outlook for the second half of this year and a 4 percent growth forecast for next year. Current economic conditions are changing within our forecast, so we'll stick with our outlook for the time being. The central bank governor said it was not yet time to change the key rate, citing expectations that a tapering of the U.S. Federal Reserve's quantitative easing could have a negative impact on the nation's economy. With the Fed poised to start winding down its 85 billion U.S. dollar a month bomb buying program sometime soon, the governor said Korean policymakers will have to make sure the local economy won't be hit by possible capital outflows. Already emerging economies such as India and Indonesia have suffered from sharp currency depreciation on speculation of the U.S. Fed announcement. If the Fed pulling back from its stimulus programs prompts capital flight in only a handful of emerging markets, the risk to the Korean economy won't be that substantial. But if foreign investors pull out from all emerging markets, the impact on the economy will be huge. With Korean policymakers mindful of negative impacts from the planned reduction of the U.S. Federal Reserve's stimulus programs, many analysts expect the central bank to keep its interest rate unchanged for the rest of the year. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Housing prices nationwide have been rising over the past two weeks following government measures to stimulate the staggering real estate market. The Korea Appraisal Board said Thursday that the country's home prices rose 0.1 percent this week, with the popular Gangnam district in Seoul posting a quarter percent increase. Meanwhile, rental prices nationwide have also climbed for the 55th week, driven by a decrease in supply and a rise in the number of people moving ahead of the winter season. Rental prices rose 0.2 percent this week, up 4.7 percent from the end of last year. By region, Seoul had the greatest jump, followed by Daegu and Gyeonggi. Now, on a different note, Korea's culture and science ministries have a plan to boost exports of the nation's content industry, which includes games, films, and animations. That plan, announced during a bi-weekly cabinet meeting on Thursday, including additional financial support to the industry, they set a goal for an annual export level of 10 billion U.S. dollars by 2017, which would be more than double the current amount. Last year, Korea exported about 4.8 billion U.S. dollars of content products. More than half of that total came from gaming industry, while more than 30 percent of the exports were headed to Japan. Well, thousands of buyers in major broadcasting stations from around the globe are here in Seoul this week for the annual broadcast worldwide trade show. The event attracts buyers from around the globe who are all hoping to get their hands on the latest hit TV shows from Asia while also promoting their latest hits. Arirang's Kim Hyun-bin was there and he brings us this report. Where can foreign broadcasters get their hands on the latest hit TV shows from Asia? At Broadcast Worldwide 2013, a major broadcast industry trade show hosted by the Ministry of Culture and Tourism that runs for three days until Friday. 
This is the 13th broadcast worldwide convention. The event is considered a hub for Asian content, allowing buyers and sellers from around the globe to exchange, purchase, and sell the superb content from their countries. Over 170 major domestic and international broadcasters are here to promote and sell their hottest products. Like other broadcasters at this market, we want to promote our channel, which is Korea's only all-English international channel. And I want to promote and sell our cultural programs, documentaries, and entertainment shows to the foreign buyers. Dramas, variety shows, and music programs from Korea have a large following in Asia and are particularly popular here. I'm a representative of a Chinese broadcaster. Um, I'm here because we think uh, the, the Korean entertainment TV shows are quite famous and very popular. But I'm here to seek any potential possibilities uh, to have some uh, co cooperation and co-production. Last year's convention hit a record high in sales, with roughly $40 million changing hands. And this year's convention is expected to facilitate even higher sales figures. Over 1,500 buyers from 50 countries are here at this year's convention. Since its inception in 2001, sales have jumped sevenfold, making Korea the biggest broadcasting content market in Asia. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, Japan is savoring its victory from earlier this week in the race to host the 2020 Olympic Games, anticipating an economic boost to spur its revival from two decades of stagnation and help it recover from the devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami. But while Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's bold gamble to throw himself into the Tokyo bid paid off handsomely, his claims to have the problem of the crippled Fukushima nuclear reactor under control ran into fresh resistance. So will the Olympic win work in favor of Abe and Japan's struggling economy? Joining us in the studio to give us some perspective is Dr. Eun Yong Soo, Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Incheon National University. Professor Eun, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me today. Now, uh, Professor Eun, now Tokyo, which held Asia's first uh, Olympic Games in 1964, has now won the privilege to uh, host the world's mm -hmm. biggest sporting event, even as the worst uh, atomic or nuclear crisis mm -hmm. since Chernobyl unfolds about 200 kilometers away from the nation's capital. What was it about Japan that appealed to the IOC committee to make such a decision? Well, I think Tokyo had a big advantage over uh, the other candidate cities, in, um, Istanbul and Madrid, in terms of uh, political stability and financial solidarity. I mean, Istanbul, for example, had not been able to overcome the concerns about the escalating political unrest in the country and the neighboring country, Syria, mm -hmm. as well. And in the case of Madrid, their campaign, which, by the way, empathized providing reliable and trustworthy Olympics had not been able to convince the IOC members uh, uh, about the ongoing worries about the economy and, and also recent uh, doping scandals among the country's athletes. So although Japan had its own issue, which is a nuclear safety, nevertheless, the other candidate city had far more serious and worrisome issues and problems, I guess. So would you say that it's not about uh, Japan's strong points, but rather about the weak points of the other two candidates that actually led to this decision? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. But uh, we hear Japanese media, they have been more or less pouring out reports about how the, the, the success for Japan to win the bid to host the Olympics mm -hmm. will definitely provide Japan with an economic boost. Mm -hmm. But uh, your take on that, Professor? Well, uh, there are some rosy uh, projections that the 2020 Olympics could provide Japan with about 0.7 or 0.8 percent of GDP growth over the next seven years, and 150 jobs will be created thanks to the Olympics. And international mega events such as the Olympics are indeed a great opportunity for countries to invest in their, uh, for example, transportation infrastructure and construction project and to promote uh, national image and tourism as well. But sometimes this doesn't work in practice. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of academic studies on the cost and benefits of the Olympic have found that every single the Olympic Games since 1960 has failed to meet the cost target mm -hmm. and that average over one has been a whopping 179%. So in other words, most of the countries which hosted the Olympics have lost their money. And on top of that, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo made a promise uh, at the presentation given to the IOC members that uh, his country uh, and his administration will resolve the uh, uh, Fukushima fiasco by 2020. But most of the uh, uh, nuclear plant experts agree that it will take at least two decades from now and it will take billions and billions of dollars to fix the problem. But uh, so you would disagree with uh, those media reports that have been uh, saying that, you know, this uh, win for to host the Olympics could even act as a fourth arrow of abenomics mm. and could even, um, you know, carry Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's second term or re-election in 2016. Well, first of all, uh, in order for so-called abenomics to pay off, uh, domestic consumption or spending is absolutely critical. Mm. And even those who support Abenomics calling for massive and aggressive uh, monetary easing and stimulus agree on that. And although, like I said, the actual economic benefits of the Olympic would be less substantial than expected, nevertheless, the, the fact that Japan has been chosen to host the 2020 Olympics will help surely uh, boost uh, the business confidence and domestic spending. But the real question here is how much, you know, how much uh, confidence and spending will increase thanks to the Olympics. And some analysts are saying that the latest Olympic success will help further boost Abe's far-right policy. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, now controls uh, both houses of parliament in Japan, which means it is better able to push through its policy agenda, right? And here, the IOC decision uh, will again boost political confidence in, in Tokyo. So uh, it is highly likely for the Abe administration uh, and the LDP to speed up the implementation of their policy agenda, you know, political and security agenda, such as the joining or engaging in a collective self-defense or revising the constitutions. But of course, there are some or a couple of uh, stumbling blocks for the Abe administration to overcome to achieve its political and security goal. I see. All right, so let's talk about uh, the, uh, its relations with its neighboring countries. Uh, what are your uh, future prospects in Japan's ties with uh, neighboring countries, which it has uh, historical and territorial disputes with? Uh, that, of course, would include uh, Korea and, of course, China as well. Uh, as I said, the psychological boost or political confidence from the successful bid for the Olympics could lead the Abe administration to push nationalism a bit further when it comes to, say, recognition of history or territorial issues. And without a doubt, this will worsen the already chilly relationship between Tokyo and Seoul and Tokyo and Beijing. But I think uh, Tokyo and Japan as the host uh, country of the 2020 Olympics must stop escalating tensions and uh, conflicts with neighboring countries over territorial and historical issues. And South Korea and China also as mature and civilized countries need to refrain from making nationalist responses to Japanese politicians. So again, like I said before, the general public in Japan are not buying the arguments of some ultra-right politicians in Japan. So we should not ride sort of uh, uh, emotional roller coaster whenever a Japanese politician make remarks on history or territory. So it is unfortunate that the ones that speak the loudest are the ultra righties of the Japan mm. at the moment. Well, we, wish we, we wish we had you over there helping them out, clear things out. Well, Dr. Eun Young-su, Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Incheon National University, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you.
Let's now get a check on the weather forecast with our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Now, Michelle, we started off the week with a few rainy, gloomy days, but it appears that our fortunes finally turned around today, at least here in Seoul. That's right, Daniel. Our clouds are being lifted a bit, uh, but don't get too used to it yet. You know, I had a feeling that it was too good to be true. More rain in the forecast. Right. We are expecting 120 millimeters of rain in the central regions tonight. And there's going to be 5 to 20 millimeters of rain in Cholla and Gyeongsang provinces. Also, there's going to be a nationwide precipitation on Friday and Saturday, which will ease up on Sunday. Taking a closer look at the forecast, as you can see, we have similar conditions throughout. Uh, so we'll start off the morning at 20 and reach 24 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will peak at 29 and 28 degrees respectively. Down onto Jeju Island, you'll see morning, uh, morning rains and until noon. And Bukdo and Mangkumgang should stay a little bit cooler. Well, that's all I have for you today. And I'm Michelle Park and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Michelle. And that's all from us for this hour. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gan Young. Thanks as always for being here with us. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you right back here, same time tomorrow. Good night.